I rejoice to be with you tonight to talk about the results of righteousness, or the sermon is also entitled, Our Assurance in Righteousness. The results bring assurance. Basically tonight, I am dealing with a verse from Isaiah chapter 32. The whole 32nd chapter of Isaiah is on the front of your sheets and it's in your Bible. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I want to read chapter 32 of Isaiah. This beautiful chapter tells of the work of a righteous king to come, to come after Isaiah. I think the chapter clearly refers to Jesus Christ, our king, and the chapter talks about things now happening. Amen. The chapter gives me great assurance. Now before I read the chapter, I'm going to flip over to the top of page two. <laughs> Isaiah spoke God's messages back about 700 years before Jesus was born. The 32nd chapter of Isaiah is one of those marvelous chapters of which the Apostle Peter spoke in Acts 3, 24, when he said, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. That is, these days after the church was established and the Holy Spirit had come. Isaiah 32 tells of the work of a righteous king to come. This righteous king, as I said, surely is Jesus. Jesus declared to Pilate, I was born to be a king. Amen. Though my kingdom is not of this world. <laughs> Note what Isaiah foretold was to be the work of the righteous king. I have six points here, all of which are drawn from the text. The righteous king, number one, would be a refuge. The New Testament says, we are who have fled for refuge yes. to lay hold on the hope set before us. Amen. Point two, the king would empower the weak. People who didn't think they could do anything, fishermen, prostitutes, destitute women, suddenly became powerful witnesses for the Lord. Point three, the king would expose the real character of people and not their press image. The king would warn of dangers to come. Jesus spoke a lot about the tribulation to come upon sinners. Number five, the king would pour out the spirit upon us. Didn't he say a lot about that? I will not leave you desolate. I will come unto you. And if I go away, the, ho the comforter will come unto you. And then the king would bring in everlasting righteousness. Now let's go back to the first page, chapter 32. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. A man will be a hiding place from the wind, a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. That phrase from a song is from Isaiah 2, 32. The eyes of those who see will not be dim. And the ears of those who hear will listen. And the heart of the rash will understand knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. That's what the king does for us. And the foolish person will no longer be called noble. You know, if somebody is in political office <laughs> and everybody says the great benefactor while well, he's a crook. Anyway, the foolish person will no longer be called noble nor the miser said to be generous. For well, the foolish person will speak foolishness and, will, and his heart will work iniquity to practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord, to keep the hungry unsatisfied, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Also the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaks justice. But a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity, he will stand. The crooks are not always going to triumph. 
Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Get out of my speech. In a year and some days you will be troubled, you complacent women, for the vintage will fail, the grapes, the gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves, make yourselves bare, gird sackcloths on your waist. These verses foretold the sufferings that would come on the ungodly. They sure did. The Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian captivity, the Roman captivity, all the other afflictions of all ages, they warned us. Uh, verse, th verse 12. People shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars, yes, on all the happy homes in the joyous city, because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be deserted, the forts and towers will become lairs forever, a joy for wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks. But look, after all the trouble, look what's on the horizon, verse 15, until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. And the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a mighty forest. Yeah. <laughs> then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. Now, this next verse is my really my punchline of this sermon. The work of righteousness will be peace, Amen. and the effect of righteousness, or the doing of righteousness, will be quietness and assurance. Forever. Wow. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings and quiet resting places. Though hail comes down from the forest and the city is brought low in humiliation. Now the 20th verse is our duty. Blessed are you who sow beside all waters, who send out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey. We have an obligation to sow in vacation Bible school, in camp, on the street corners, on the internet, everywhere we are. At the bottom. Isaiah 32, may, uh, verses 17 and 18 also may be translated, the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the service done by righteousness shall be quietness and confidence forever. And my people shall dwell in tabernacles of security, in settlements of quietness. Are our church assemblies tabernacles of security? They ought to be. I've seen some churches that were places of screaming and nasty, cutting politics. The word translated at ease, woe to you who are at ease, is the same word translated quietness. The sinner is at ease, he thinks in his sin. But turmoil is coming. This suggests that being at ease in sin is to be replaced by being quiet in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Next page. The third paragraph. In his work as king, Jesus exposed the true character of the hearts of people as Isaiah foretold that he would. Jesus says the world hates me because I testify that its works are evil. People don't like to be told that. No way. Uh, in the kingdom of Christ, the fool will no longer be called noble and the miser no longer be called generous. The people who are at ease and complacent in sin will find themselves in a desert of distress. But, at, but then after that, the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon us from on high. The desert shall become a fruitful field and justice will dwell in the desert. The work of righteousness will be peace and the service done by righteousness, quiet and assurance. Quietness and assurance. Now, skipping down to where it says the word righteousness. The word righteousness in Scripture has three related, though distinct, meanings. Number one, righteousness is the quality of goodness, kindness, and mercy that God has. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Amen. Righteous are you, O Lord. Sadly, this natural righteousness is not in us people. Jesus said, if you be evil, we don't have it. Our lives are like a garden. 
If a garden is untended, it goes to weeds. If we're not tended to by the Word of God and by people who are controlled by the Spirit, our lives, too, always become full of weeds. It just always happens. So, there is the righteousness of God. Secondly, there is the righteousness, which means acts of goodness and honest conduct by people. In every nation, he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted by him. God did not save us by our works of righteousness because, because all our works are imperfect, but according to his mercy. Thirdly, righteousness is not only uh, the righteous quality like God has and righteous acts, but thirdly, righteousness is a bestowed state. Yes. A bestowed quality given by God. And that's the righteousness that I'm basically talking about in this sermon. It is given by God to those who have faith in his salvation. The great vivid illustration of righteousness being bestowed as a gift to people is that of Abraham, of course. Abraham told half-truths about his wife, Sarah, being his sister, to protect his own hide while leaving Sarah in danger. Yet, when Abraham believed God's promise that he would have many descendants, even though he was childless and nearly a century old, when he believed God accounted him righteous, God gives us the same gift of righteousness. When God makes us righteous, he acquits us of all guilt, and more than that, he places within us a new spirit of eagerness to do good works. Amen. At the bottom. We certainly are not saved by our good works. Our good works do not take away our sins. However, God creates within us a spirit and a disposition to be zealous to do good works. And while we're not saved by our good works, the attitude to do good works is an essential feature we must have in order to be saved. The attitude that we should be doing good works is essential within us. Amen. The absence of desire to do good works is nearly a sure sign that we're not God's children. That's right. sure. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. Amen. Sorry about that. Now, a lot of people are very much at ease and unconcerned about the righteousness. Uh, they're like Andy Cap. They're not interested in being holier than thou. They're more interested in being wickeder than thou. Uh, that's their big distinction. See how rotten they can be. Why should we be concerned? This is page three. Because God will judge the world according to his righteousness. This is a very often stated uh, truth in the Bible. Check your concordance. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, Jesus. Point two, because only the righteous person will live with God. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. Amen. Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Point three, because righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 11, 4 and 6 says, righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the upright will deliver them. The unfaithful will be caught by their lust. Many people have died because of drunkenness, drug addiction, AIDS, fights, tobacco, venereal disease. Anger has killed a lot of people. And other sins... People would have lived long if they had sought the righteousness that comes from God. Yes. Number four, because we shall see God only if we're righteous. The psalmist said, as for me, I shall see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Yes, amen. I like that. The blessings of God's righteousness which he bestows upon us should cause us to sow the seed beside all waters. Now down near the bottom of the page in bold letters is my 
major question and point in this sermon tonight. Why can we have assurance and confidence that we're right with God and have assurance? A lot of people don't feel like they know they're saved. Why can we have the assurance that we are righteous? Two reasons, both drawn from our text. The righteousness is the work of God and not of ourselves. Amen. Amen. And secondly, the effects of righteousness are so obvious and powerful that they should convince anybody except the most closed-minded. Number one, we can have the assurance that we're righteous because righteousness is the work of God in man rather than man's own work of self-improvement. Psalm 37, 5 and 6, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Page 4. Psalm 23. He leadeth me. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Isaiah 45, 8. Rain down, O heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. I, the Lord, have created it. Amen. So, we don't have to wonder whether our righteousness is adequate or not. Righteousness is the gift and the work of God. And God is called, and Christ is called, the Lord our righteousness. Yes. God's people are called trees of righteousness. Amen. Growing in the forest of thorns in this world. For you shall go out as you go to preach with joy. And be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall uh, break forth into singing before you. <laughs> All the trees of the forest shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, which is a delightful little bush. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Wherever we sow the seed of the gospel, Christ brings forth kindness. Instead of divorce, faithful marriages. Instead of drunkenness, soberness. Instead of yelling, kind words. Instead of child abuse and child neglect, child care and child affection. We ought to love our children. Instead of revenge, forgiveness. Hello, you trees of righteousness. You didn't know you were trees, did you? You're not blockheads, you're just trees. Are you listening to your king who transplanted you and planted you beside the streams of water and poured his spirit upon you? What fruit are you bearing for him? Blessed are you who sow beside all waters. Yes, now certainly, we have a part in seeking, in getting this righteousness, though it's the gift of God. What is our part in obtaining God's righteousness? We have to pray and praise for it. Notice Psalm 118, verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness. Have you ever prayed that prayer? I will go through them and praise the Lord. Amen. What have you found yourself singing today? Well, every day you should sing spiritual hymns and praises. Amen. Seek that righteousness. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness and humility. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? They shall be filled. And then you get God's promises. When you believe God's promises, this is point three, believe that God is going to do something for you. Colossians 2.12 says, we are buried with Christ through baptism. At that same time, we were also raised with him through faith in the working of God. Amen. We got to believe God is going to do something for us. <laughs> we must believe that God is going to work to make us good and to empower us to serve him. Pray that we may know the greatness of his power that works within us. Yes. The very power that God used to raise up Christ from the dead. Amen. Point four. Walk by the Spirit. Yes. I say then, walk by the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Isaiah 32 passage indicates that the work of righteousness 
was the very same thing as the work of the Spirit. The two verses are one right after another. The Spirit should be poured out upon us. Next line, the work of righteousness. The two are linked. When the Spirit of, is poured out upon us from on high, then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. Page 5. At the top. Galatians 5.5 5 says, We through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Amen. Jesus taught us to pray for the Spirit in our lives. Yes. yes, he did. If you, then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Mm -hmm. It is true, I believe, that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. I believe that. But the Spirit is a gift that must be cherished and cultivated. Amen. Amen. We must walk by the Spirit as well as have life by the Spirit. Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, we have new life, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. I fear we do not preach as often as we should on walking by the Spirit of God. Amen. Do you even know what that means? I hope you do. Point five, we must present our bodies unto God. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. Your hands are to minister to the needy. Your mouth is to speak the words that are full of healing. Our members are to be given to righteousness. Point six, do acts of righteousness. To Christ's church, it is granted to be arrayed in fine linen, preparing for the wedding supper of the Lamb. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Blessed are you who sow beside all waters. The righteousness that God imparts is to make us new in every activity of life. For example, a righteous person who works in a nursing home should never abuse or neglect patients in the nursing home. Ever been around nursing homes? A righteous person should never lie about something wrong with a used car, even if he's selling it. Better to tell the truth and get a little less money than to lie about it. That's why they never hired me for a used car salesman. <laughs> never, a righteous person should never throw his rubbish in somebody else's yard. A righteous person should never charge people for work not done. Whether you're fixing a car or a computer or fixing a leaky roof or plumbing, whatever, you just don't do it. A righteous person does not throw firebombs or explosives at his enemies. He takes apple pie to his enemies. A righteous person should keep a deal or promise he made, even if he got a better deal later from somebody else. He swears to his own hurt and changes not. Amen. That's true. A righteous person should speak evil of no man, mm -hmm. not even of our politicians. Now that would stifle some people's conversation with him. A righteous person should not charge interest on money lent to help someone. A righteous person should never take a bribe to do anything evil or to hurt the poor. The blessings of righteousness are the gift of God Amen. and they should cause us to sow beside all waters. Now I said basically tonight I'm asking the question, why should we have assurance that we're righteous? Because righteousness is the work of God in our lives. Secondly, because of the effects of righteousness that have been seen in the world. You know, instead of the thorns, there come up the fig tree, and uh, the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the doing of, of the service of, of righteousness shall be quietness and assurance forever. We can obtain an assurance of righteousness by seeing the effects of the gospel of Christ in history. The prophet Isaiah said that the results of righteousness would be peace, quietness, and assurance. 
The world without God has had ceaseless wars and conflicts. There is no peace, says my God to the wicked. If they're not fighting with fists, they're fighting with guns or words. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Our world has experienced a major war about every generation, as each new generation that has not seen the horrors of war has grown up. Is there any hope for peace? Yes. The time is speedily coming when they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's true. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Page six. Jerry Tepron, a Rawong, that's one of the tribes in Thailand, a Rawong evangelist and translator in Thailand, said that in former generations, the Lee Su and Rawong tribes in Thailand fought wars continually even though the tribes outwardly looked much alike. Outsiders couldn't tell them apart by looking up. Usually the Lee Su defeated the less numerous Rwong tribes people. Since the gospel has been preached among the Lee Su, there are now some, there are now probably close to a million Lee Su Christians in Burma, Thailand, and China. The work of righteousness shall be peace. Since the gospel has been preached among the Lisu and Rawong tribes and thousands have accepted Jesus as Lord, wars have almost totally stopped between these tribes. And the tribes are intermarrying. <laughs> so the two tribes are merging into one race in Christ. The work of righteousness shall be peace, the prophet said. And it has been peace. Mm -hmm. Dr. George Green uh, home on leave from the mission field told this experience. When I first went out to the mission field in Africa, the boat carried me up a wide, beautiful river flowing through the jungle. And as the sun set and the night came on, I listened with much misgivings to the roll of the war drums. Ooh. They continued far into the night. The captain of the boat was uneasy and tried to dissuade me from going ashore the next morning. And I admit I was trembling with fear. But I found that the Lord standeth within the shadows, keeping watch for his own. And after years of delightful labor, I left the jungle on the same boat. As it came down the river, thousands of these natives, same natives, gathered on the shores near their villages to say farewell. And as the boat came into sight, they broke into song, but not a war song. They were singing the hymn that was a favorite of most of them. All hail the power of Jesus' name. The work of righteousness shall be peace. Amen. Amen. And the doing of righteousness shall be quietness and assurance forevermore. In 1849 and 1850 was the great gold rush to the gold fields of California. In that same year, the first missionaries were sent to the Fiji Islands, where a human being could be bought for the market price of $7, killed and eaten without protest. In 1900, just 50 years later, you could not have bought a human being in all the islands. For all the gold that had been mined in California from 1850 to 1900, there were then over 1,200 Christian chapels in the, in the Fiji Islands, and nine-tenths of the population went to church every Sunday, and human life was as secure as it was in any city in America. The work of righteousness shall be peace and the doing of righteousness quietness and assurance forevermore the early christians after the lifetime of, of the apostles of christ lived in a world where one out of every five people in rome was a slave homosexuality was practiced blatantly by the roman emperors and by multitudes of people infants and children could be abandoned in the streets if you even cared Thousands of animals and men were killed in the theaters to entertain crowds looking for excitement. In some areas, Christians were put to death when they refused to offer sacrifices to the Roman gods or the Roman emperors. Pliny, the Roman governor in the province of Bithynia, 
wrote to the Emperor Trajan that he had tortured and executed some of the Christians because they would not offer wine and incense to the Emperor's statue. The Emperor said, you did the right thing. Pliny wrote that when he tortured the Christians, they confessed that the sum of their guilt was that they met regularly before dawn oh, on a fixed day, I think it was Sunday, to chant verses alternately among themselves in honor of Christ as if to a God and to bind themselves by oath not for any criminal purposes but to abstain from theft, robbery, and adultery and to commit no breach of trust and not to deny a deposit when called upon to restore it. And after that ceremony, it had been their custom to disperse and reassemble later to take food of an ordinary harmless kind. The work of righteousness shall be peace and, and, and quietness. In spite of the perils to their lives, the Christians eventually got the gladiatorial names, the game stopped, and laws were passed to protect children. Now I'm right at the bottom of page six, and there's an error there says 19th century England. This should be 18th century England. My computer doesn't know how to spell. <laughs> 18th century England was a painful place to live. John Wesley says, nine-tenths of the men in England have no more religion than horses and perish through total contempt of religion. Next page. Montesquieu wrote of the higher classes of society in England. Everyone laughs if one talks of religion. Ha! Huh, he's religious. The parish priests of the time spent more time in drunkenness and fox hunting than in preaching or praying. William Cowper had nothing better to say of the parish priest than that he was, quote, loose in morals, in manners vain, in conversation frivolous, uh, in dress extreme, at once rapacious and profuse frequent in the park with lady at his side, ambling and prattling scandal as he goes, but rare at home and never at his books. It was an age of beastliness and debauchery, savagery and violence. A writer in 1791 said of the British coal miners that they married and buried among themselves and often committed murders with impunity. Government! insulted humanity by the brutal ferocity of its criminal code. There were more than 200 crimes in England that could be punished by death. Prisons were indescribably filthy. Those who escaped the gallows came out emaciated and diseased. Liquor was the curse of the poor, the destroyer of life. In 1749, it was calculated there were 17,000 private gin shops in London alone. If you walk down the street, one out of every six houses was a pub. Signs on the door said, you can get drunk for a penny and dead drunk for two pennies. And have straw to lie on and recover free. Purity and fidelity were sneered out of fashion, you old blue nose. Even the prime minister was an immoral man. The mania for gambling ran unabated. Christians have no business gambling. If you want to make a good investment, don't put it in the lottery. Put it in the Lord's treasury and give it to the poor. Amen. You will receive many times over. Amen. Amen, that's true. But gambling was, a, a, uh, the mania for gambling ran unabated. Stakes were played high at the king's palace. The brutal pastime of bull baiting and bear baiting and cock fighting constituted the delight of all classes. It was unsafe to walk or travel the London streets. John Wesley said that the traders in England had less honor than the heathen. Let us appeal, Wesley said, to Cicero, an honest heathen. Cicero proposed a test involving honesty. Antisthenes brings a shipload of corn to Rhodes, the island, at a time of great scarcity. The Rhodians flock around it to buy food. He knows that five other ships laden with corn will be there tomorrow. Ought he to tell the Rhodians this before he sells his own corn? Or should he continue to gouge them high prices, not telling them that there'll be plenty of corn tomorrow? 
The heathen Cicero said, undoubtedly he ought to tell them there will be five ships tomorrow. Otherwise he makes a gain of their ignorance and so is no better than the favor of other. Wesley wrote, how many of our tradesmen come up to the heathen standard of honesty? Which of our countrymen would, have, would not have sold his corn and other wares at the highest price he could get? Who would have sunk his own market by telling his customers there'd be plenty the next day? Perhaps not one in 20. Wesley's call to honesty and kindness in every activity of our lives echoes the word in Psalm 15. Lord, who may, dwell, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money at usury, nor take a bribe against the innocent. Wesley spoke of attorneys and those representing others. Do, do the generality of attorney, attorneys and solicitors love their neighbors themselves and do what, if the circumstances were changed, they would have others do to them? A lawyer who does not finish his client's suit as soon as it can, I cannot say to have more honesty, though he has more prudence, than if he robbed him on the highway. You keep charging him money for lawsuits that you don't need to lay on him, you're a robber. Wesley, after his heart heartwarming religious experience, was burdened to preach. Now, you don't have to agree with everything John Wesley says, or Alexander Camel says, or even Wilbur Fields says. But there was a great work of righteousness in this man. Amen. And all things are ours, Wesley, Camel, Blakely, all they're ours. Amen. And I'm happy to claim it. Wesley set out to preach, and he found that the established churches weren't reaching out to the poor. No one set out on a great adventure with more determined foes to overcome than John Wesley. Page 8. Against him was the mob, the clergy, the aristocracy and the press. But Wesley was adamant. Throughout the plains and mountains and villages he preached. In stables and inns and barns. In churchyards and markets. In bowling greens and orchards and streets and lanes of the cities. He preached the doctrine of repentance and personal faith and God's love for every man. Wesley endured nearly continuous ugly and riotous interference of mobs during his first 30 years of preaching. Meetings were attacked by drunken, brawling rabbles armed with clubs, whips, clods, bricks, stones, stink bombs, wildfire, and rotten eggs. Drums were beaten, horns were blown, church bells jangled to drown the preacher out. Guns were fired, and ballad singers hired, dam mill dams let out to flood him out. Once at Birmingham, it was dangerous for anyone who stood by to hear, for dirt and stones were flying from every side, almost without intermission for an hour. Where churches would let him would not let him preach, he preached in the churchyards. <laughs> That's something. Wesley preached at the opening of mine pits when the coal miners went to work at 5 a.m. in the morning. Preachers for one preach at five o'clock. He told the laboring poor that they too were precious in God's sight, that they had a soul to save. And to, and to maintain equality with the richest people in the land. For the crushed and despised miners to hear over and over again that God loved them, that they could be saved, it sounded strange in their ears and filled them with astonishment. The effect on their minds and hearts, the revolution in outlook and society was phenomenal. Many changed themselves. Wesley made a practice of preaching at 5 a.m. on most days. The practice was begun in order not to interfere with the working hours of his hearers. The miners of Newcastle would go to work at 5 o'clock in the morning, so he'd meet them there to preach to them. The miners at Newcastle came to hear him at night and slept on the benches of the old meeting house so they might hear him again at 5 in the morning before going to the pithead. Wesley considered preaching at 5 in the morning the healthiest exercise in the world. <laughs> Woo this is something. The typical miner of the time was drunken, dissolute, brutalized, tyrannized over by his employees and their underlings. The majority of the miners had never gone to school in their life. To these people, Wesley 
and his preachers brought the Bible and the hymn book. And they brought to them a desire for learning and improvement, which soon led to the establishment of the first literacy schools in England. And at one time, there were more church schools in England than there were public schools. And they were established by the church. Wesley's labors should uh, inspire us to sow beside all waters, to turn many to righteousness. Wesley preached for 53 years. He preached no less than 52,400 times, an average of three sermons a day for over 50 years. Woo! <laughs> he preached his last sermon eight, year, eight days before he died. In addition to his sermons, he organized and superintended hundreds of societies in every part of his kingdom. He wrote 233 books and pamphlets. I don't know how in the world he did all this. He wrote and he read and wrote continually as he traveled. He traveled over a quarter million miles, mostly on horseback, equivalent to nine times around the earth. He wrote lessons for children and compiled a Hebrew grammar. <laughs> I wonder why I mentioned that. Uh, Wesley sowed seeds beside all waters. Wesley gathered his hearers into groups that he called societies. These were open to people of all ages, both men, women, and children, and they were urged to do good deeds to all people continually, last page, and to teach others to do good. Wesley never attempted to start a new denomination. He sought to work within the established church, but it eventually proved out that the established church wouldn't repent. Uh, Wesley's followers were requested to abstain from fighting quarreling, brawling, brother going to law against brother and returning evil for evil. The necessary fruit of temper was manifested in hungering and thirsting to do good in every possible kind. Give none that, ever, that asks relief from you an ill word or an ill look, Wesley says. Don't give him a dirty look. Wesleyans were enjoined to constant vigilance in their attention to distress within their societies but they were warned that they must not allow their love of beneficence to be confined to Methodists. Now, Wesley didn't want his followers to be called Methodists, but some people hung that name on. He said the true Christian was to do all possible good of every possible kind to all men. When giving a definition of an altogether Christian, Wesley affirmed it means, among other things, the love of our neighbor. And lest anybody should be in doubt who is my neighbor, he added, every man in the world. <laughs> That's wonderful. Men who wanted to work as preachers with Wesley were told to be active, avoid all laziness, be clean, avoid all nastiness, dirt, slovenliness, both in your person, clothes, house, and all about you. Whatever clothes you have, let them be whole. No rents, no tatters, no rags. I wonder how that would have gone over in style the last few years among our <laughs> ragged clothes pad. Uh, Wesley said, This a scandal alike to men and women, being another fruit of vile laziness. Mend your clothes, or I shall never expect you to mend your lives. Use no tobacco or snuff unless it's prescribed by a physician. Field's commentary on that is if it goes if the physician prescribes it, get another doctor. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway. Wesley asked, What have been the consequences of the doctrines that I have preached for the nine years past? By the fruit you shall know those of whom I speak. The habitual drunkard is now temperate in all things. The whoremonger now flees fornication. He that stole steals no more, but works with his hands. He that cursed or swore, perhaps in every sentence, has now learned to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice unto him with reverence. As John Wesley in England brought about a great improvement in his country, the American evangelist, Barton Warren Stone, also brought about a great change in the states where he preached. Stone's evangelism was a leaven for righteousness in society. In his wake, Bible society sprang up. Stone's preaching gave the temperance movement, that's opposing liquor business, fresh impetus. It is on record in the old minute book of the Bryan Station Baptist Church in Kentucky 
as late as 1795, it was, not, it was held not inconsistent for a member of the church to carry on the distillery business. Neighborhood dances subsided during the stone revivals. I said tonight, what are reasons that we may be sure we have righteousness? Because it is the work of God in your life and because you've seen its power at work since Christ sent forth the Spirit upon us. Amen. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the service done by righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. 